Yeah, we'll stick with you, Tony, because you were involved some of the pivotal studies as we move to the next drug, which is rifaximin. Um, mechanism of action, how do you think it works? What, what, what's your thought on that product? Sure, so uh, rifaximin, of course, is a broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, but it's different than a lot of other antibiotics. And I think it's worth just taking a step back because one of the risk factors for developing IBS in our clinic is patients who have taken recurrent antibiotics. And so it requires a little bit of a discussion because some patients will say, well, well, I think I might have gotten IBS because I took you know, antibiotics for you know, a year due to rosacea or whatever uh, beforehand. And so we will have to discuss that, that rifaximin um, is not bacterial cytal. It doesn't actually kill the bacteria. So it's not going to change your flora, which is the good news. It's not going to get, uh, increase your risk of developing C. diff. Um, the bad news is we don't actually know exactly how it works because it doesn't change the flora. It probably changes the way the bacteria bind to or interact with the mucosa. Um, but the data is, is quite compelling in, in IBS, uh, particularly IBS with diarrhea, that, uh, that it improves symptoms. It improves abdominal pain. We had a poster uh, at this meeting on its effect on abdominal pain. It improves bloating and, and global IBS symptoms. Uh, the dosing is typically 550 milligrams three times a day for, for 14 days. That's the FDA-approved dosing for it. Um, and it uh, works both in men and women. It doesn't seem to be long-lasting, though. I mean, it's not a permanent fix, so patients oftentimes need to be retreated. And, and that was, uh, there was a lot of questions around that, which led to target three, which was the third uh, pivotal trial done uh, with rifaximin, and that was a retreatment trial. So a little complicated because we it wasn't your standard just placebo or drug. In this case, patients who took rifaximin and they knew they were getting rifaximin uh, and improved and had a recurrence within uh, four months, four or five months, uh, that they were able to be randomized into either even rifaximin or placebo, and that um, and showed that there was still improvement uh, in symptoms. So you could retreat patients. Uh, and in fact, in that study, patients got up to three doses of rifaximin, and it did seem to continue to improve symptoms more than placebo. Uh, so it, it looks safe. Uh, it's effective, not effective in everybody, uh, but in a subset of patients, it can work. And you use it in your practice. Uh, what's your pattern of practice in terms of retreatment, or how do you gauge when the time is right to retreat? Yeah, so I do use rifaximin in my practice. Um, uh, you know, not in everybody. As I sort of mentioned earlier, I have kind of combinations depending on the unique patient uh, profile. Um, but yeah, when I use it, um, uh, I typically wait to see uh, if somebody has a response at all. If somebody doesn't have a response, then there's no point in talking about retreatment. But when it works, in my experience, it really works. I mean, when it works, it works. You can clearly see people have benefited. Um, bloating, discomfort, diarrhea gets better, and they feel completely better. Um, uh, but the key, as I sort of just heard, is it's not necessarily a cure. For some people, it really can be. It's almost as if they've been reset somehow, um, and they do well. Others, they come back. Um, personally, I will retreat once. After that, I'm going to send them to you uh, because uh, we work in the same clinic. But we quite do. honestly, I mean, um, you know, I just want to make sure that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking there's something else that we need to think about before I go down, you know, six retreatment courses. But I also am cognizant of the data that, and I think you've published some of this work, that uh, retreatments are successful. It's not like there's a diminishing return curve where, you know, people no longer respond at all or become resistant to the medicine. But one of the things that we see in practice is, the patient will call us and say, I think I need retreatment. How do you handle that? What, what's your threshold to say, go again? Um, do you wait for them to have a regression of 50% of their symptoms? What's your, what's your thermometer for retreatment? Yeah, you know, I don't know that we have great guidance on that, and I must say that I've been recalibrating that over time. Um, I initially would just rely on what the patient told me, and what I was finding was a couple things. First thing was um, that there were some patients that would have so much anticipatory anxiety about their symptoms coming back that they would be pulling the trigger with really minimal symptoms. And that worries me because, yeah, we do have data up to th three retreatments and it works, and I think that's I'm super excited about that. But we don't have data where people are treated 10, 20 times. And really, when you're talking about a, a disease that primarily affects young women, that's what we're potentially looking at with um, long-term use of rifaximin. 
So I've become more circumspect over time. In other words, um, now I actually query the patients carefully about what symptoms they're experiencing and how close it is to where they were when they, when they started. I mean, the good news is the data would suggest, and my clinical practice would definitely reflect that the patients don't seem to get back to the level of severity uh, that they were suffering with when they, before they start treatment. So I, I'm, I'm not requiring people to go back to that, but I, I just want to make sure that they're symptomatic enough to justify another course of, of an, antibiotics, and particularly rifaximin you know, is an expensive medication that many patients have to pay out of pocket for. Now, Brendan alluded to that when they do respond, they really respond. Oh, yeah. The mag magnitude of response is fantastic. Is fantastic. Agree, but yeah. So in the TARGET-3 trial, and maybe I'll ask Rezai about that in his clinical experience, do you see the TARGET-3 data? Because it was almost a true-to-life trial because everybody gets refraxment in the beginning and you see what happens. Um, in your practice, do you see that 33% just one and done, or at least they go for prolonged periods of time without retreatment? Because that was what was seen there, six months, no relapse. Yeah, exactly. So. At the beginning of target three, everybody got open label Zyfax and, and 44% responded. And out of those, 36% uh, did not have a flare for uh, 18 plus four weeks, which is 22 weeks after uh, the open label therapy. So there is definitely that group of super responders to uh, rifaximin that when you treat them, they come back and was like, oh my God, uh, the bloating is gone, the bowel movements are, are uh, have uh, dramatically improved, uh, and then yes, there is, there's that group that they, they do respond, and then they have a flare that they require uh, retreatment. And yes, and there is a, a group that pa uh, of patients that they don't respond uh, to therapy as well. I think that reflects the heterogeneity of the underlying pathophysiology of irritable bowel syndrome, um, uh, which I understand the refaximin uh, mechanism of action is not completely understood, but uh, clearly it works on microbiome. And not every IBS patient's symptoms are driven by microbiome, so they're a different pathophysiology. So I think that also uh, the lesson that you're learning from uh, the treatment of patients that we have to go back and probably uh, find those buckets of patients with different pathophysiology and target them uh, via a more precision medicine.